you know, you know, you have to sometimes decide what mountains you're going to die on. Good morning and welcome to the Green Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. As it still is being filled with the local members here, I want to give a warm welcome to those watching online. We are so glad to have you with us as we start this new month in February. Look through your bulletins, and we have a couple of announcements, but as you do that, I'm going to invite Patty to come forward and give us an announcement here at this time. Just a little reminder this morning, if I haven't caught you yet or you haven't yet turned one in, we have these forms that are green that are sitting out in the narthex on the table for your emergency contact information. <clears throat> and this is a pretty important thing for us to have if anything should happen to you um, during some kind of church function when you're here. So. There is a place for a first and second contact person and their relationship. So please think about that. If I don't grab you out, outside or in the snack room, please pick one up and bring it back. You can either give it to me or you can put it in with the offerings. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. And we have another announcement as well from Terry at this time.
So I want, just want to remind people that if you would like the opportunity to provide the snacks for after church, I am signing up people for this year. Um, next week is potluck, but the following week is available. And then I think weeks in April, May, August, November and December. Um, you can do one week you can, and see how it goes if it's something you've never done before. And the church will reimburse you $40 for the snacks. Um, you can, you know, choose a week in the future and see what other people do as ideas for what you might want to bring for snacks. But we'd love to have you contribute in that way as well. Just see me. And as you have had time to look through your bulletin, you will have noticed some sad news that we have to inform everybody with. We have had a 26 wonderful years with Wanda as our organist, and she will be retiring May 20. And so it has been such a privilege to have Wanda with us, and that will continue through these next couple of months. But be praying for us and for Wanda as we consider that next transition. Other announcements to, to point out, each weekend is busy in regards to the young adult collegiate. We had a, another Bible study last night at the Meridian House, good turnout, and we're thankful for the consistency that's happening around this. The week before, we had our soup and prayer, really good turnout for Bible Jeopardy and lots of soup and fun activity. So each weekend, we have something, and if you look in the bulletin that way, uh, you can see the events that are going on. This afternoon, we have the second in our book club on the LGBTQ plus Adventist in the Bible, and we had another really good, robust conversation about that. Even if you have not read the book, but you're interested in engaging in the conversation, feel free to join in, and that's this afternoon at 2 p.m. And I think outside of what you can read in the bulletin, that's all I have for now. So at this time, we will have our opening hymn.
Bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being here this day because we know that you are in this space and we pray that you would bless it as we hear the service, the music, the words, and the special music. In your name we pray, amen. We see a show of hands for all of us who love to pay taxes. I don't see very many hands out there, but I do think about that once in a while when I do have to pay taxes or I look at what's being taken out of my paycheck of all the things that I get for my taxes. I get roads to drive on, I get parks, I get preserved parts of the country that are so beautiful that wouldn't exist without paying our taxes. I get health care, or at least part of it, I get many, many things as a benefit of paying taxes. As my father taught me a long time ago, there's also what's called a popular tax or uh, taxes that you like to pay. How many of us have ever considered or had vanity plates? That's a popular tax because you get what you want specifically. Now don't think of me as saying anything sacrilegious here, but what about what we give to God? The big difference is God does not require us to pay taxes. He gives us the benefit of his love. He gives us the benefit of this beautiful church. He gives us the benefit of all the things that we get from our church, the fellowship, the chance to come together with like-minded people, the trips to Rosario, many, many things that we get as a result of, of having the church here. But there's no that tabulates, did you pay your combined budget? Did you give to God? Did you pay your tithe? No one is here to check on that, and no one does, and God doesn't either. It's all voluntary. It's based on our faith and our appreciation for the things that God shares with us, that we choose to give as an offering from our hearts to participate not only for our saying thank you for ourselves, but to enable God's work, his church, to be able to do more, to bring more people to him, to have activities, to give more comfort to those who need it. So as you consider your offering each week, I would encourage us to think of all the benefits that come from the offering and remember that it is truly voluntary. It doesn't pay your way. It doesn't make you in better form with God but it is truly from the heart and a blessing as we do so that God, that we have a chance to participate in the love and relationship of others in Christ Jesus. There are two ways to pay, well, probably more than two, but the two that I think of is if you are in the church and you want to drop your, church, your offering in the box at the, in the North Axe, that's there for you each week. And we also have, which is the much easier thing, you can pay online. So as you consider what, what is good. Thank you. Good morning. My story today is going to be about, about houses. Now, I brought a little house here for you to see. It's kind of a reddish color. Do any of you live in a reddish colored house or building? One, okay, yeah. It's not the most common color of a house here. When I think of reddish color, of that color, I tend to think of barns. Um, but what color are the colors of your, where you live? Anybody want to tell me? So the right, whitish gray. Blue and some of it white. Blue and white, okay. Yeah, Sarah, did you want to say? Mm, blue. Okay, any other colors? Houses? Okay. 
Well, this um, is made to look at, like a particular type of house in a different country. Do any of you have grandparents that were born in a different country? Lots, lots of us. Okay, can you tell me the country where your grandparents were built, born? Philippines. Okay, anybody else? Uh, Colombia. Anybody else down here? Uh, Taiwan and Iceland. And uh, Japan and China. Japan and China, okay. Any others, did I miss anybody? Okay. I know where my, my friend's mom and dad grew up, but not mine. Okay. Did I miss anybody? Well, this is made to look like the very common houses for the poor people in Sweden, which is where my, my mother's parents came from. They, they were called stugas, which means cottage, basically. Um, and I, when you drive through the countryside in Sweden, you see stugas everywhere. Um, maybe they were the poor people who had homesteaded out in the woods. Maybe they were the poor people who worked for an estate. And um, if you look at the screen behind you, there you'll see some pictures of some of the stugas that came from my family. So this is the stuga, and the houses there and farms have names. So this is Storedet. This is where my, grand, my mother's mother was born in Storedet. I don't think it looked quite quite as well upkept probably when she was born there. It's, it's a summer house now and very nicely kept. Okay, the next one. This is Sutosa, and this one was kind of falling down. It had a good roof when we visited. This is where my mother's, let's see, my mother's mother's grandfather lived towards the end of his life. It's a fancier stuga because it has two stories. And it was very cool to visit. This one is Bagatorp. And this is where my grandfather's grandparents lived when they had three kids. It has two rooms on either side of a central fireplace. And you can see we were visiting there. And this is Klippen. Klippen is one of the places where my grandfather's, I think grandfather had worked as a hired hand. When they lived at Klippen, well, and in, in most of these, they did not have indoor plumbing. Do any of you know what it means to not have indoor plumbing? Anybody? Do you guess? You don't have pipes and things like that. Yeah, and more specific, when you don't have pipes, that means you don't have a faucet to bring you water. So at, when they lived at Clippen, they had to go down to the stream that was down in the gully below their house to get their water. And when you don't have pipes, you don't have a toilet inside. So you would have an outhouse. Let's see. Now I thought all these cottages out in the country were red because the paint was cheap. It was it got the red color from the copper mine in Falun. It's called Falu Red. Um, and it was easy to make. It had very few ingredients and you could mix up the paint and cook it in a cauldron in your yard. And we don't usually see people cooking their paint in the cauldron in their yards when we're painting our houses nowadays. But my husband was tempted. He thinks the recipe is pretty cool. It has water and rye flour and linseed oil and a couple other things, but not much. Um, but when I was reading last night, what I learned was that actually um, the paint was started back in the 1500s when the king asked the mine to make up a paint because he wanted to paint the palace's roof red. And then the next century, it became trendy to have red paint. And the mayors would have the people paint the facades of the houses red if the king was going to pa uh, pass by, because then they thought it looked like the important buildings in mainland Europe, the brick buildings. The next century, the big houses, the um, state owners and the manor houses out in the country were all painted red because that trend had gotten to them. And then in the 1800s, it got to the cottages. So all the cottages were painted red, partly because it was cheap, but also, as it turns out, the paint, because it has all those metals in it from the leftover bits of the mining, it helps preserve the wood. I think it helps to, um, the moss doesn't grow in the wood. So it had a side benefit. And so it's very iconic now, so iconic that you can find, um, you can buy magnets of stugas when you visit. It's a touristy thing. Yeah, Raven has a little magnet to show you, yeah. When I thought about talking about houses, I instantly thought about a book, and can you reach me the book? 
that we received when our oldest son, Julian, was born. And sometimes when babies are born, people give gifts or there's baby showers. I bet you know about baby showers and maybe have been to one or you know about one and the gifts that were given when you were born. This was a gift that was given by his cousins because they really loved this book. And it talks about houses. I'm going to, I'm going to read you just a couple pages here. I'm going to try. And the pictures aren't great, so I want you to think about the pictures in your mind as I read this. A hill is a house for an ant. An ant, a hive is a house for a bee. A hole is a house for a mole or a mouse. But a house is a house for me. A web is a house for a spider. A bird builds its nest in a tree. There is nothing so snug as a bug in a rug. And a house is a house for me. A coop, that's a house for a chicken. A sty, that's a house for a sow. A fold, that's where sheep all gather to sleep. A barn, that's a house for a cow. It's also, of course, a house for a horse. A kennel's a house for a dog, a dog. A dog is a house for a flea. But when a dog strays, a flea sometimes stays, and then it may move in on me. Houses for rabbits are hutches. A house for a mule is a shed. A castle's a house for a duchess. A bed bug beds down in a bed. Mosquitoes like mud holes or puddles. Whales need an ocean or sea. A fish or a snake may make do with a lake. But a house is a house for me. And once you get started in thinking this way, it seems that whatever you see is either a house or it lives in a house. And a house is a house for me. A book is a house for a story. A rose is a house for a smell. My head is a house for a secret, a secret I never will tell. A flower is at home in a garden. A donkey's at home in a stall. Each creature that's known has a house of its own, and the earth is a house for us all. Did you notice that as I was reading, sometimes I knew what the next line was? That's because I've read this book so many times. And I bet you have books in your house that your parents have read many, many times too. Now, I brought, one of the things they talk about in that story is that a nest is a house for a bird. And I brought some bird houses here, some nests. And Raven's going to pass, take it around for you to see. This one is a hummingbird nest. So think about how little and tiny the babies would be to fit in that nest. We were very lucky, even though we have a tiny, tiny yard, a hummingbird made this in the vine maple on the north side of our yard. <laughs> and then the next one is a bush tit nest. This one I didn't know was there until I actually had cut the bottom of the little tree that it was growing on that was growing up through my rose bush. And as I tried to thread it out of my rose tangle, I discovered this nest and I was so shocked I had to see if I could secure it in spot place until the family um, was done with it. It was in the spring. And a family was successfully raised in that nest. <laughs> Let's see here. Sometimes we also hear people talking about another kind of home. You might have heard somebody talking about God or Jesus living in your heart. Or hear the church referred to as the house of God. Which is kind of interesting when you think about it, because there's many churches. And you can, I'll let you think about that. The houses in the book I read weren't built to awe us into thinking about God. They were built for love and safety. And another 
house that I brought is inside the first house. So if we lift this up here, and Raven will bring it around to show you. I found this when I was hanging up my garland at Christmas time and discovered that the chickadees who I'd seen coming and going indeed had built a nest in there. And there are six little chickadee eggs still in there, so I don't know what happened. I don't know if there were some scary birds that um, made them think it wasn't a safe place after all, and so they abandoned it. Or maybe they, the eggs got too cold because they took too long make, getting food, or maybe they were just practice eggs, I don't know, in a practice nest. Um, so do any of you know what I need to do to prepare that for the next family this coming spring? Yeah. Clean the, the place up. Exactly. I need to clean that wonderful little nest out and probably wipe it down with a mild bleach solution. And I, it breaks my heart to think about disturbing that sweet little nest, which is why I'm telling this children's story today. I had to show that nest to as many people as possible before I destroy it. So I'm glad that you got to see it today. I have to take it out. I am going to destroy, I'm going to, maybe I'll tr take it out very carefully. But yeah, the whole thing has to come out. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, those two nests I'm keeping. They, they have been left. But this one, I don't know if I can take clean it out without Maybe. destroying it. Yeah. So it's not going to destroy the big one. No, no. And one thing, um, what was I going to say? Oh, oh one thing that the, those of you who can't see the nest, come and visit me after church, and I'll let you look in the um, birdhouse. It's quite charming. I love the way that they built up the moss so that the babies couldn't fall out onto the floor of the house. Okay, this, this afternoon and in the next few days, I want you to look for various types of non-people houses around you. For instance, as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking that your shoe is a house for your foot. Think about other, other non-people houses, but also think about what it means to have Jesus living in your heart and for this to be the house of God. Okay, time for the buckets.
to our most loving and powerful God, the creator of all things, the caretaker of us all, our spiritual guide and our protector. We thank you for all that you give us. We thank you for our housing. We thank you for our jobs. We thank you for the opportunity to know you better each day. We ask at this time that we remember the needs of our members of our church and other members as other people as well. I ask you to refer to your bulletin if you want to pray specifically for people. But the things we need to be praying for as a group are the health of our friends, relatives, neighbors, and individuals who have asked specifically for prayer listed in the bulletin. God, your gifts to us are so incredible. Our health, the gift of minds to, to think, on our, uh, think for ourselves and to be, guide, to be guided by you and create a relationship with each other and with you. We thank you for the blessings of life far too many to enumerate, but the beauty of life that, we're, that we were given by you. I know that each of us have certain requests each time, and we want to send a special prayer for those requests. Each of us have challenges, each of us have difficulties, and many times those requests need extra prayer. So as a group, we pray for all those special requests for each individual person. Peace of mind is a gift from you. Peace of mind is something we gain in our relationship with you. Oftentimes we put our own burdens in the way. We find our own fears in the way. We create our own problems. And when we have a relationship with you, we are blessed with guidance from you to how to overcome those things and gain peace of spirit, peace of mind with not only ourselves, but our relationships and most, mostly with you. And I th we thank you for that special blessing of giving us peace of mind. Lastly, we ask that you create in us a new spirit. We were born with a carnal nature, and as we gain spirit through our relationship with you, we gain strength of character, we, create, we gain love, we gain so much. We ask that, that you continue to guide us each day to know the things that are right and to identify the things that are wrong, that will make us stronger. Give us the strength, we pray, that we will follow you, especially at the times of challenge, when it is so difficult at times to find you or to follow you. Give us the strength of our, of your, give us the strength that you give our faith to in those difficult times to re to find, find it in our spirit to rejoice in you and accept the many blessings that you have for us each day. We ask these things in thy name. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. 
When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. The New Testament reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. May the Lord bless the hearing of the word. I have a, a first photo to show you. During peak air travel times in the US, there is approximately 5,000 planes flying every hour. This translates to 50,000 aircrafts operating in our skies each day. 
But how is it that those planes keep from colliding into each other? The task of ensuring safe operations of commercial and private aircraft falls on air traffic controllers. They must coordinate the movements of thousands of aircrafts, keep them at safe di distances from each other, direct them during takeoff and landing, and direct them around bad weather to ensure that traffic flows smoothly and with minimal delays. It's a big job. Therefore, air traffic control should be and typically are the people keeping everyone safe. However, just a few weeks ago, you may have heard about the mishap with American Airlines and Delta Flight 1943, if we have it. This took place on JFK runway, and air traffic control cleared American Airlines cross runway 31 left. What was supposed to happen is this top plane was supposed to go this way and behind the bottom plane. That is not what happened. The American airline pilot was to take a right turn to go behind the plane when suddenly he took the wrong way and he cut in front of this plane that was taking off. And so the air traffic control had to come into action and they suddenly, they told this bottom Delta plane to halt and to stop taking off and they landed, well not landed, but they, they didn't take off yet, but they were just a thousand feet shy of the other plane. They nearly crashed. You can take that off. The ground, Adama in Hebrew, means when God created it, it was supposed to be a safe place. But we know that when Satan came down here, it altered our world, and it became not such a safe place anymore. Therefore, because of this, it would seem that we have a duty as children of God or people who believe in God to try and make it a safe place. But how often have we taken a safe place or a holy place too far? And how often have we abused the idea of a holy space? We consider this, the sanctuary, a holy space. But what makes it holy? Is it the pews you're sitting in? Perhaps the organ, the preaching, or the hymns that we sing? Surely it is the quiet presence that we enforce. But Paul says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And when we accept him in our life, and might I add that accepting the Lord Jesus does not have to mean through baptism. I think it can mean as soon as you walk through those doors. You chose to be here, to dwell among the presence of God that others are bringing. You chose to fellowship with believers and you chose to be here today. So, if we really do take Paul seriously, then we will hear his words in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, again. Do you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Some people think that it is their place to judge the people coming through those doors, or the people that are making coffee in the next room or for not dressing appropriately. They think it is their place to shush the screaming or running children or the chattering during the last song. And we've gotten really wrapped up in trying to make this space presentable, yet quiet, grand with music, yet reverent, and relevant. But the truth is that when people enter this building, building with their hearts open to receiving God or their hearts filled with God, that is what makes it holy. Because God dwells within us, 
This space is not holy without you in it. And that goes for any other space. God within us makes all ground holy. It's not just the church building or the steeple or whatever you might think. The holy ground includes the kids running down to the front for children's story or the chattering amongst each other before the countdown, before the church starts. It includes the shouting of answers or questions from the pews. God is in all of that. When we choose God, all ground becomes holy. Therefore, there is no room to condemn this space or any other space more holy than the other or more blessed. In an Adventist Review article about the sanctuary, it says this, the biblical sanctuary is a sacred place, both here on earth and in heaven where beings come to worship God. It is the command center of the universe where angelic hosts come in and go in loving service of their commander. The sanctuary is also a place of refuge where God is engaged in saving the endangered species of humankind. The sanctuary is a, safe, is a place of safety and quiet where God invites his people to come by faith and escape the hectic and threatening pace of today's living. It's a beautiful picture. In summary, it says that the sanctuary is a sacred place. The sanctuary is a place of refuge. And lastly, the sanctuary is a place of safety and quiet. And at first glance, I agree. The church should be sacred. It should be defined as religious or filled with God. The church should be a place of refuge, a place sheltered from danger or trouble. And yes, the church should be safe, but quiet? When you come to church, what do you do? You chat with others, you catch up on the chaos of life that we go to together through. And I don't know that when we come here that we are escaping that chaos, but rather we're coming together as a congregation of people that live in a chaotic world. And if we don't come together, we never become a community. Because quiet or silence never equals community. We have created a totally different kind of sanctuary. And what if the definition that we have set for church or sanctuary is actually gatekeeping God? What if our definitions or restrictions on a holy place is just our attempt to play air traffic control, to control the ground that belongs to God? We've created a totally different sanctuary. And if we go back to the biblical sanctuary, are you going to tell me that that was a quiet place? The priests are in there and they are preparing the space with the incense and the prayers ascending. And in a typical service, the sanctuary was cleansed with the blood of an animal sacrifice. Bringing a live animal to the altar certainly was not quiet. With people going in and out to sprinkle the blood, this space is surrounded by chatter and animal noises. In fact, it was even dirty and smelly, certainly a barnyard setting. It's a rectangle divided by curtains, no real ba barrier for sound. I have a slide here that has impacted me this week while writing this, because truly, when we step into the role of defining what the church building is or should look like, we take control over what isn't ours. This is God's ground. The Starbucks down the street can be God's ground. Your eccentric neighbor's house can be God's ground. The sanctuary is the place where our heart is. This is only a sanctuary because we stand here filled with the love of God. 
not because we are quiet or because we walk instead of run or because we sing hymns, but, but because we are who God called us to be. We are ourselves and we believe in him. We are able to praise with our hands lifted high. We are able to leap for joy when we hear the word of God. And we are able to be loud in the house of the Lord. Exodus 3.5 says, Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And when Moses took off his shoes, it is not necessarily the part when the ground became holy. Let's look at the text above. It says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and I will see the strange sight and why the bush does not burn up. And it says, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, do not come any closer. Have you ever been in a place where you instantly knew or felt that it was holy or sacred? Where was it? Sometimes it is in a church, in a sanctuary, in the fellowship hall, or sometimes it's at your school chapel, or sometimes it's in nature, or at one of our Adventist camps. But have you ever felt it in a strange place, a place where you didn't expect to see sacred ground? For me, I remember feeling it strongly in the middle of downtown San Francisco. I was there with a group called YWAM, which stands for Youth with a Mission. And we do a lot of things on these trips, including, you know, uh, hot chocolate and prayer the first night. And the next day, we pack a lunch for ourselves and for a friend. And we go out and we eat with the homeless and we talk with them for hours. But downtown San Francisco is not a place where you would expect to feel sacred ground. It's not very holy at all. But one of the days that we were on this trip, and this is probably the most impactful part of the trip for me, is we went around and we were praying. We were praying for people, but we were also praying for particular situations, what they called massage parlors. And we would go around and we would stand at the opposite corner of those massage parlors and we would pray. And the YWAM people leaders, they told us that since that they had, since they started doing this, a lot of those places had closed down. And so as we stood and we prayed for those places, we prayed for the ones existing, the ones that were suspected, and the ones that we didn't know about. And that ground became holy to me. Because we went around and we brought God with each of us to those places through our prayer where you never thought holy ground could exist. God is presence in the midst, and when we come near, the ground becomes sacred. God saw that Moses chose to leap out in faith. He chose to come near to God. Moses approached the fire in faith, and the ground only became holy because God was present. In Hebrew custom, it was ritual to take off your shoes when entering into a home. Not because of the obvious filth of your shoes, but merely as a sign of respect. And not only did Moses take off his shoes, but he covered his face. And he did that as an act of reverence, acknowledging his unworthiness before God. God is the very essence of holy. God wants to dwell with God wants us to dwell with him. He never wanted to make that hard. And I have a hard time relating to a God that would be stuffy about me talking before the church service. Or a God that wouldn't take pride in his children running around with the little blue buckets. God must smile when he sees people sharing time with each other in his house. 
There's a song by a Christian artist named Pat Barrett. It's entitled, Everything is Sacred. And one of the lines that caught my attention in that song says, you do not see the lines between secular and sacred. And it reminded me of a pastor in Southern California, and he says, if Sabbath doesn't lead to Thursday, then we missed the point. And what he means by that is because this church, every Thursday, they do their outreach ministry where they feed families in need. And if what they do on Thursday doesn't lead up to Sabbath, if their secular never becomes sacred, then they missed the point. The point is not just to congregate and spread the love of God with each other, but to go out and be a sanctuary for the other. He titles this, Saturday is Miracles for Us, and Thursdays is Miracles for Them. There's a video I saw this week that transformed my thinking of holy ground, and I'd like to show it to you right now, if possible. Today, I made roti with my family in Delhi, India, at a Gurdwara, a Sikh temple. It was incredible to learn about the faith and about their kitchens. Every temple has a huge kitchen where people volunteer to cook food for a cafeteria that anybody of any faith can come in to enjoy food. It was such an incredible experience. They also had this huge automatic roti making machine that could spit out 4,000 rotis an hour. It was mind blowing and just such a beautiful concept and anybody who needs food can come in and eat. In this Sikh temple, anyone of any faith can come and eat. And that machine that they have, that they have invested in, spits out 4,000 roti a day. It is fascinating to see what they have decided to do with their holy ground. They turned it as communal as it could get, arguably. People come every day and they volunteer their time and they removed their lines between secular and sacred. They created a space to come together every day to build community. And I imagine it's a little bit of a chaotic space to be in with the, the machine going, the people talking and the people eating and the volunteers there helping. And you know why that is? Because silence doesn't equal community. And when we compartmentalize our lives into secular and sacred categories, we risk relegating church stuff to Saturdays and thinking that the rest of the week belongs to us to do and live as we please. But that's not biblical. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 Summarize says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, for it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Everything we do is for the glory of God, and we are called to love with our whole heart and all of our strength, not just what is left over. Even the sec secular can become a sacred ministry for God. God does not see our lines between secular and sacred. That's actually a Greek mentality. The Israelites would not have seen those lines. The Israelites did not think, oh, God left us during the week, but he comes back on Saturdays for us. They didn't draw those lines between secular and sacred. So let me leave you with these couple of questions. Let me ask you, so the sanctuary is sacred, but the fellowship hall is not. Since when? And don't get it wrong because I'm not saying that this space is not sacred because it is. But how far does the holiness extend? What kind of holy ground can we create within ourselves? for ourselves, and for other people? And how can we be that refuge, sacred, and safe space? I think we best exemplify that by God's second greatest command. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
So stop trying to play air traffic control. This is God's ground. your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for coming into this space with us. We want to ask that you would remind us that you dwell in us always and that we take your presence wherever we go and that we could remind others of your love. Lord, we eat the bread and we drink the grape juice, but help us love our neighbor. In your name we pray, amen. Amen.